No. And my mom's cousin sells like bouquets. And so I told my mom, I tell my mom, but my like, don't make my brother do too much. And I'm like, but after all, my All right, so I'm going to get started and introduce Corey Blickenstaff, who is um, amazing, and I'm sad everyone outside won't hear about him. See, Mike will because he came in. Okay, so Corey owns and operates Forward Motion PT, physical therapy, um, which provides on-the-job site physical therapy um, clinics in the Vancouver, Washington area, utilizing various movement and manual therapy approaches. Shh. The Canadians, come on. Sorry, Corey. All right. Um, various movement and manual therapy approaches to empower people toward an autonomous state of health as it relates to movement. Corey also hosts, along with Sandy Hilton, who sometimes will listen, um, of the popular Pain, Science, and Sensibility podcast um, on the PT Podcast Network, which if you haven't heard of those yet, check them out, subscribe. Corey works with individuals who are dealing with movement-related problems, such as pain or orthopedic injury, as well as employers who are struggling with the consequences of pain and injury on their workforce. Thank you. Services are also provided to individuals hoping to improve performance at work, play, or fitness, and who are looking for guidance on maintaining healthy movement through the lifespan. He's also presented nationally on topics including application of graded exposure, graded activity, edge work, novel movements, movement variability, as well as application of care to the workplace. He's also authored a monograph on prevention strategies in the workplace through the American Physical Therapy Association. So I'd like to welcome Corey. Okay, thank you. Have you guys noticed how Sarah and Sandy can kind of communicate with just like eye connecting? Like, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's really nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, the last time I was up here, my, my presentation was called The Edge of Interaction. So uh, I'm not very creative. I just called this one The Next Edge of Interaction. Um, but I, I will try to tie that in a little bit as, as to what I mean about that. Um, you know, the first thing I want to cover is just kind of some fears and goals I have up here. This kind of is important as well. Uh, you know, you always have a lot of kind of what ifs when you're about to present. Uh, you know, for one thing, the topic I'm going to cover, uh, I'm going to be going over some potential criticisms of some very popular models and things that are out there. And you always worry about throwing shade on something or it seeming like you're trying to throw shade on something, especially something that you really yourself have a lot of respect for, or somebody, uh, uh, somebody's particular beliefs. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the biopsychosocial model and the bi versus the biomedical model. And at a certain point, it's kind of like, uh, you know, pain conference jeopardy, or uh, not pain conference bingo, right? Like that's always kind of a thing that's talked about at some point along the line. And, and you worry a little bit about it just kind of beating a dead horse that gets a little repetitive. Um, you know, another big kind of fear or what if is, you know, what if you misrepresent something, right? Like what if, you, uh, what if you misrepresent somebody's work or somebody's thoughts or their particular take? And uh, there's always, for me, what I like to call the Todd effect, right? Todd Hargrove, you know, which, but this is a good thing, right? No, Todd, I'm about to sing your praises here, man. <laughs> so, you know, you, you write these things sometimes with, with the thought in mind of, um, you know, what are some kind of criticisms or critiques or things that you might encounter? And hopefully, like me, you've got a friend like, like Todd that you have in the back of your mind. I know Todd knows this stuff, um, and I know he, could, he would probably come up with some questions, so you kind of write with that in mind. And, and that kind of thinking of how might this be, you know, what if this is wrong? What if, what if I'm doing this wrong? That's, I think that's an important part of the process, an important part of critical thinking. And then I also want to present uh, something called a phenomenological framework. Maybe some of you are familiar with that, uh, but I'm going to get into some of that as well. And if, 
kind of a worrier, right? Like as far as the what ifs go, this morning I get up and I get dressed and I put on this green sweatshirt and I realize like, man, I look like Ned Flanders, right? <laughs> I mean, what if, what if I hadn't noticed and I had worn this up here? I would have just been humiliated for, for life. But anyway, so the first year I was here, uh, Lorimer Mosley was here, and one of my favorite things that he said that I think is so important uh, at, the end of, at the end of the whole conference was he challenged us to think about how might this be wrong, right? We, we tend to think about that in terms of things we are already a little bit critical of, but what about the things that we like? What about our um, kind of our pet treatments and our pet ideas? How might those be wrong? And what are some ways that, that we might want to challenge those? And, you know, to Laura Mosley's credit, he lives it, right? I mean, he's the, the pain neuroscience uh, education explain pain guy. This amazing study came out this year where they went out and they tried to do that, right? They set up this study where they said, okay, we've done all this work. We think this is working well. We think this is what we're going to see. But if it were wrong, this is how we would be able to tell. And they went out and they did that study and turned out they did not get the effects that they thought that they would. And I, I thought that was just amazing. Actually, that was just a study that came out this year. Everybody's familiar with that, probably? Yeah? Okay. So, biopsychosocial. How might, this, how might this be wrong? Okay, maybe something that we don't typically think about. Biopsychosocial model is presented a lot of times just as if it's correct um, categorically as it stands. So, it might be something that uh, is not so easy for us to think about how might this be wrong. But I think maybe what's a better question would be how might we be using this wrong, right? So we're gonna talk, talk about some of this. There's been some concerns raised about the biopsychosocial model. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm gonna be bringing up some other people's ideas here. Uh, Stillwell and Harmon had an article that came out in 2019. This was a really popular article. This was the, uh, the inactive approach to pain beyond the psychosocial, biopsychosocial model paper. Um, in that paper, they brought up some concerns that it was overly vague, and it tended to separate uh, people out into two or three domains. Um, and it was, they, they feel like there was, an over, there was a tendency towards an over-focus on the biological part of the biopsychosocial model. Um, tends to poorly relate to subjective experience. And we're gonna get into this a little bit more. Um, no strong theoretical foundation, lacks physical coherence, and is overly mechanistic as it chops the patient into neat packages, okay? What I'm gonna go through is why, what we're gonna call these things, right? What, what actually is the biopsychosocial model? Because I think we, we talk about it in multiple terms and we don't often think about that and they're not necessarily interchangeable, okay? So uh, another set of concerns that were brought up, this was by Carr and Bradshaw, um, they had a suggestion that one of the domains was more important than the others. They actually thought that uh, you should turn it around and call it the socio-psycho-bio model in order of, of importance, the social aspects, the social determinants of health being, being more important, okay? And uh, this brings me to uh, Sandy and I's podcast, right? Anybody who talks to me for very long at all, eventually I'm gonna bring up Norton Hadler, right? He's kind of my, my uh, my guy, um, we were lucky enough to have him on for an interview on the show a couple of years ago, and he said some things on there that I've just always thought, boy, I wish this information could get out there. So I thought, what a great opportunity. I'm up here in front of all these people. I'm gonna make you listen to him for a few minutes here, but it's also relevant to what we're gonna talk about. So this is gonna be about six minutes long. Uh, bear with me, right? But trust me, he's more entertaining to listen to than I am, so I'm doing you a favor has nothing to do with modalities or medical interventions. Over 80% has to do with the ability to feel comfortable in your skin. And, and I worked long and hard on coming up with some way to teach this. And the comfortable in the skin is the best of it. It's not simply wealth, um, it, but, it, but that's the easiest measure. If you're in the lower quintile of socioeconomic status in a society such as ours, it will cost you seven to eight years of longevity, all-cause mortality. It's like you go back decades in the history of the health of the population. Uh, 
it, it doesn't take long to, to change that. For example, longevity in Russia went down 10 years within the decade of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it had nothing to do with health averse behaviors or cardiovascular risks because they were maximum before and they were maximum after. They couldn't have bigger gut butt ratios, smoke or drink more, be more sedentary. So, so there, there are experiments like that that are absolutely fascinating. And, and, and people don't know about them. They don't know about the, the a number of them. For example, uh, the Finnish 10 city studies. Um, Finland's a fascinating country. It's genetically pretty homogeneous. It has a very effective national health insurance scheme. So losing your job has nothing to do with your health care. And uh, at one point in the 90s, the Finnish economy tanked. And it tanked uh, to such an extent that 10 of the cities which had been followed since World War II had to announce to their bureaucracy that they were going to almost certainly have to let people go. And the epidemiologists who were part of the study had been following that workforce right since, since World War II. And about half of the cities had to let a significant percentage of their workforce go. Uh, and what happened was fascinating. First thing that happened in the downsizing city is that the number of workers, particularly elderly employees who found their next backache intolerable, escalated rapidly so that whatever savings they had from downsizing, they lost in workers' comp. Now, that's not because people know how to game the system. That's because you're going to have a backache. And it's going to hurt worse if your job is insecure, you're fighting with your spouse, you're in debt, you work for a fascist. We have a whole bunch of these influences that will make your next backache hurt worse. And that's not because you're a weak person. That's because you're a person. It's much easier to cope when life is going pretty well. And it's much harder to cope when it isn't. So the first thing we learned from Finland is that we can create an epidemic of incapacitating back pain out of the normal role of normal intermittency of backache. The next thing we learned is that those people who were let go in the five of the 10 cities had a five to 10 fold increased likelihood of major cardiovascular mortality within five years. And those people who stayed behind in the downsized city had a two fold. By the way, th this is, um, well documented, this kind of notion of, of comfortable in your skin and the way we can measure these things. They, they're, um, they even happen to primates. You, you don't want to be the unhappy baboon. You want to be the happy baboon. You'll live longer and do much better. And, and, and so we need to understand that if you want to do health promotion, disease prevention in a society like ours, by the way, I can give you lots study these natural studies there no way to do this as an active experiment it's been thought about it's actually being tried in our country but there you want to do something the first thing you ought to do is the next time that you hear that some one of our major employers is about to downsize or go part-time you ought to think health don't think stock market think health and, and the next thing you ought to do is you ought to say the health of our society really depends very much on, on how we handle our people who feel that they have no opportunity. So if the physical therapists of this country and the physicians of this country wanted to do something, let's do something that relates to uh, distribution of opportunity. That's not money. That's opportunity the sense that you feel like there's something you can do and, and we're loaded with it. By the way, this, the discrepancies play out in health parameters, even in a city like Los Angeles, you don't have to go to two countries. And, and if you do go across and transnationally, or you can do it in this country, it's called the Robin Hood effect. If you, if you look at the distance between the income level of the lowest quintile with the highest quintile in each state, the bigger the gap, the sooner the poor die. So the northern Midwest looks a lot like Canada, 
and they do much, much better than the Southeast. And the poor in North Carolina have more purchasing power than the poor in Greece. But the poor in Greece live longer and it has nothing to do with olive oil. Okay. So, <clears throat> for one, I'm not just trying to sell Sandy and I's show, but we basically just turned on the microphone and he talked for an hour. It, it, was, it, it was gold. So uh, I would recommend uh, everybody listen to what he had to say. But um, some things that were interesting that what he said, right? He said that we know that, that an epidemic of back pain can be created by the social upheaval of a loss of stable employment, right? A, a, social, a social change created, created a change in an illness presentation, right? And, you know, the specifics that he mentioned were the people that were let go had a five to tenfold increase in cardiovascular mortality, and the people who kept their jobs, who were left behind, had a twofold increase. Okay, so this is big. And uh, these are some of the studies that are in the, the finished 10 city studies. I just wanted to have them up there for your reference. Um, so obviously there's, there's things going on here. I, when, I'm, when I say we're going to go through criticisms of the biopsychosocial model, obviously there are impacts of the, of the social determinants of health. So what's going on here? And, and one thing, too, that I think really helps make, uh, make some sense of this is Another saying of Dr. Hadler's is that a disease is something that an organ has, and an illness is something that a person has, right? So the, bio, the biomedical model is suited well towards disease, and the biopsychosocial model was meant to be suited well towards illness, okay? And some of the problems that are well documented and well talked about at these conferences were some of the problems that came about when the biomedical model that's well suited to disease tried to look at everything as a disease. Okay. Um, some more concerns that were brought up. This is by Smith et al. from 2013. Uh, one of their big criticisms was that they did not think it was testable. Predictions cannot be made and tested to evaluate it. This is a big problem um, as far as it being potentially a scientific theory. Uh, it's too general. It requires all of the biopsychosocial information and is therefore unwieldy. Right? You have to collect all of this information. I got to have all of the information between all the different components to, to see what is the actual interaction, and then I have to make a decision about what the interaction is. Uh, it doesn't actually give a particular method. The model doesn't specify how to operationalize it, which is what a model is for. Okay? Uh, the fundamental flaw is that it doesn't tell you how to consistently get the relevant aspects of each domain for each patient visit. And their suggested solution to, to, to make the, the model scientific was to systematize the interview and data collection processes so that it's repeatable. All right, so then, then it could be testable. So let's look in terms of what they mean by the testability uh, aspect of this. And I always like to do this. I think this is fun. Okay, so what I'm going to have you all do, we're going to do a little class participation here. I'm going to have, uh, actually, we're just going to do um, the second row. I'm going to have the second row stand up. If I did the entire class, this would take, the entire conference, this would take all day. <laughs> so if the second row could stand up, um, oh, a couple of you guys I'm going to have to knock out. You know what I'm going to do. Don't you? You don't? Okay. Sandy, you might know what I'm going to do here. All right. So what I want you to do is try to guess my rule, right? This, these, the sequence of numbers, two, four, and eight, meet my rule. So what I want you guys to do is ask me questions. You can give me three sequences of, of numbers. And I will tell you whether or not it also meets my rule. And when you think you know my rule, have a seat. OK? So go. Yeah, Sandy, you're up. Don't be shy. There's no wrong. Is there multiplication involved? Uh, no. Just so, so give me three numbers. Oh. What you want to do is give me three numbers, and you're trying to see if that, if that also meets my rule. That meets my rule. One, two, four meets my rule. Yep. Uh, three, six, twelve. Three, six, twelve meets my rule. Any other ideas? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Hey. You guys still in? Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure I follow the people sitting down. Yeah, yeah, so if you, if you think you know the rule, you can have a seat. 
This is live entertainment, folks. It's, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> yes? Zero, zero, zero. Zero, zero, zero does not meet my rule. Okay, got, it, got any other? Okay, so go ahead and have a seat. What do you guys think my rule is? Any, any? Doubling the previous number does not meet my rule. That is not my rule. A gradual increasing numbers, that's right. Nick got it. So my rule was just that the numbers had to be increasing in order. Okay, so what this is meant to be a test of is to see the types of questions that people ask when they're trying to test a theory, right? And usually in this, in this game, people ask questions that they think are consistent with the rule, right? 248, 124, things like this, right? But we don't really get, I mean, you could go on forever and ever and ever, people. You could go like 1,000, 2,000, 4,000. You could throw out any, any sequence of numbers, and it's still not going to get you to that my rule was just an increasing number, usually until you try to ask a question that breaks the rule, right? And so this is, a, this is an example of a couple of things. Uh, for one, this is, this is meant to be an example of what confirmation bias is. We are humans, and we tend to be more biased in the direction of seeking confirmation. And you hear confirmation bias uh, thrown out there all the time. This is an entire room of critical thinkers, and we still demonstrate confirmation bias. This is not a problem of people who are uh, of weak intelligence or are not thinking critically. This is a human issue. We are humans. We have confirmation bias. This is just how we're built, right? Now, the other thing that this, uh, that this potentially shows is the value of a falsification question, okay? So now that you know kind of what I'm after, now I'm going to give you the Wasson selection test, okay? All right, so my rule is if the card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face is red. Okay, how would you test my rule? I'm going to let you think about this for just a second, and then we'll do a show of hands thing here. Okay, so you're going to be allowed to flip over one of these four cards. Okay, so you think about which card you want to flip over to test my rule. Okay. So if you would like to turn over the three, raise your hand. Okay. If you would like to turn over the eight, raise your hand. Good. If you'd like to turn over the red card, raise your hand. Okay. And if you would like to turn over the brown card, raise your hand. Okay. Good. So the correct answer, what you're actually looking for here, is to turn over the eight and, and the brown card, actually, right? So when you turn over the eight card, you'll know whether the other side is brown or red. But you don't necessarily know uh, that all even numbers, right, or that, uh, that red cards only have even numbers on the other side of them. So you have to turn over the brown card to see whether that's true as well, okay? So again, now that you even know what I'm, what I'm asking for, it's still kind of a hard thing to do. Falsification is, a, is not a natural process for us. It feels, uh, feels like we're swimming upstream a little bit. Okay, and so this guy's Karl Popper, a uh, philosopher of science. You know, again, these what ifs, this is where I get a little nervous. I'm talking philosophy of science, which I'm really into, but if somebody really knows their philosophy, they'll hand me my lunch pretty quick probably. But uh, what he said was what, uh, what actually was the line of demarcation of what was a scientific inquiry was whether or not it could be falsified. Okay, whether it had the potential to create a prediction that, that could be shown to be wrong. Okay, if, if the only way, if, if, the, if the problem had no solution that could not be falsified, then it's not a scientific question. Okay, does that make sense? And so, the way that he made it, uh, the, the way that he made it simple, the example he liked to use was the, was the white swan issue, right? If you have a theory or if you have a, a hypothesis that all swans are white, right, how many swans would you have to see to prove that that is correct? All the swans, right, which is not going to happen, 
or you will never know if it happens. But one black swan disproves the theory. Okay, so this is, uh, this is his example. This is the black swan problem of Karl Popper. And when I read, uh, uh, when I read Conjectures and Refutations, this was one of Karl Popper's famous books, he goes through this example of, of some thoughts that he, some, some approaches that he thought were non-falsifiable. And one of the ones that he went through was psychoanalysis. And he said psychoanalysis, no matter what finding there is, whether it be positive or negative, psychoanalysis could always explain it. Right? So there was no finding that would ever had the possibility to show that it was wrong. And when I read that, I remember thinking, that kind of sounds a little bit like, like the biopsychosocial model a little bit, right? I mean, so, so the case in point, Dr. Hadler just went through this, ten, this finished 10 city studies for us, right? So think about if we, if we looked at the biopsychosocial model as a scientific theory, there would be both an explanation for why those people got worse when they lost their jobs, but we could just as easily come up with an explanation using the biopsychosocial model for why people would did, did not get worse, right? So if they, if they had the resilience to, to withstand that and not have a problem, that also is explained by the biopsychosocial model. Okay, so there's, there's multiple things. Obviously, there are things that we can test in biopsychosocial model, but that kind of struck home to me as, as a potential issue. So that's the question. What is the biopsychosocial approach? Is it a theory? Is it a model? Or is it something else? Uh, Engel, the, the, per, the guy who came up with the biopsychosocial model, thought it was a model. This is his quote. The hallmark of a scientific model is that it provides a framework within which the scientific method may be applied. The value of a scientific model is measured not by whether it is right or wrong, but how useful it is. Okay, so scientific models are meant to be a, an application of a, of a theory or of a hypothesis. But the problem with this as a model is that it doesn't really tell us how to use it. It doesn't really give us the formula of how we might, you know, what, what combination of bio and what combination of psycho and what combination of social are the, are the recipe that becomes pain, okay? So this comes from uh, a, a critical review of the biopsychosocial model, this, this uh, paper by McLaren. He says, what is a model? Models are... Theories are ideas, as such they can have only logical consequences. By contrast, the whole point of models is that they are experience generators acting rapidly to generate an approximation of the, the material consequences which flow from the application of the theory. Right? So again, when you think of the biopsychosocial approach as a model, I don't know that it gives us, you, you don't really know how the, the different, as, the different uh, components interact with each other specifically. Right? More from McLaren, uh, to be science. However, the theory itself must be more than a mere metaphysical claim. Its propositions must cast in a form which permits empirical testing, which is where the model, the model comes into its own. Uh, simply stated, the purpose behind a model is to see if at first approximation the theory works to actualize its logical consequences and thereby subject it to the kinds of severe tests which Popper saw as essential to sci scientific progress. Okay. So, this is the picture that I use to describe the biomedical model, right? It's very mechanistic in its, uh, in its workings. An impeding agent leads to a disease. You have a, you have a virus, you, ha you get an illness, right? Um, and that application to how that was attempted to be applied to what we do is the pathoanatomical model, okay? But, you know, again, what is the recipe that eventually ends up as pain? How do we know which factors should be addressed. Okay, so when, uh, when Engel described the biopsychosocial model and how he thought it should be used, he looked at it as a gathering of information from all of these different components and there was a decision that needed to be made of which components were still important. So it remains mechanistic and this is one of the criticisms is that when it is viewed as a model, it is still mechanistic in nature. It's just more, uh, more robust. There's just more um, aspects to the mechanistic nature of it. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to bring up some things by John Quintner. Uh, 
A lot of you guys probably know John Quintner. Some of you might be fighting with him on Facebook right now. <laughs> okay. Don't all right. all the yeah. If he's on there right now, tell him I said hi. Okay. But uh, you know, some uh, some of the most influential papers I've read have been uh, have been Quintners and their groups, um, and this one in particular is still uh, is still one that was was and remains a game changer for me. This is their uh, pain medicine and its models helping or hindering. Okay. Their criticisms of biopsychosocial were that it lacks a theory of how the different domains interact with each other, which we've just talked about. Um, in so doing, it perpetuates mind-body dualism. You know, having um, their, their thought on the way the IASP definition of pain was, was written and the writer that was attached to it was that it still uh, put things that were not easily explained by nociception and tissue damage in the domain of uh, psychological. And so therefore, uh, it, was, it remains in the mind-body dualism problem and uh, for that reason can be stigmatizing, is what they say. Now the other thing that is interesting about this is that they say that it imposes the worldview of the clinician observer. Okay, and I like to look at the biopsychosocial model kind of like a prism, right? Or you could look at it like a prism. So if, if you shine, if, if, the, if the prism is the biopsychosocial model and the white line on the left is the person in pain, when you shine that person through a prism, it reflects all of their colors out onto the wall, right? So it is a third person perspective of their presentation of illness, okay? And the reason why that they claim the criticism that it, 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 it uh, privileges the role of the observer is that as the clinician, your job is to look through those things and decide what is important, okay? So it gives you a privileged position as a clinician. So this is a third, a third person narrative. But another way that you might look at this is that it might be a little bit more like a three-sided lens, right? If the light bulb in this picture is the person with low back pain or whatever, and each of the three sides of the lens are a different component of biopsychosocial, it shows that you're looking at it, you're looking at the same problem from different perspectives, okay? And, it's, and you can look at it from this way to say that any pain problem that is a, a, an illness-based problem is going to have biological components or perspectives that you can look at it through social perspectives and psychological perspectives all at the same time. And it depends on, on the perspective you're taking as you examine it, all right? So I think this makes sense into what they're saying in terms of the biopsychosocial approach actually being a conceptual model, right? They think that it fails as a theory and that it fails as a model but that it makes sense as a conceptual framework that gives us ideas for treatment and ideas of ways to assess our patients, okay? What they said is that they acknowledge these issues and they call it a conceptual framework. It should be seen as a conceptual framework to assist in the clinical assessment of an experience of pain from the observer's point of view, okay? So it has, it has some utility, right? So it, when you look at it in this terms, when we try to clarify what it is we're actually calling it and what purpose it's serving, it, it's, it's, got, it's got a purpose, it's got a good purpose. We need third person perspectives. That's, a, that's an important aspect of being a healthcare clinician, of being someone looking at a person in pain. Okay, so but next what I wanna introduce is a different, um, a different potential conceptual framework. Uh, this comes from the Meanings of Pain book. Uh, this was a book that came out a couple of years ago. It was put out by Simon Riesvik and, and that group and it's, it's a great book, compendium of multiple chapters all written by different authors. Might even be a couple of them in the audience here. I know Bronnie Thompson's not here, but she's, uh, she's got some, uh, a chapter in there. Mike Stewart uh, has got a chapter in there as well. But this is one of my favorite chapters. This one was really influential on me as well. The Phenomenology of Chronic Pain, Depersonalization, and Repersonalization. Okay. So what is phenomenology? This was, uh, uh, and, and still is something I'm chewing through, uh, but this is one of those papers that I've read multiple times and it just kind of keeps me awake at night as I just keep thinking through the implications of it. So phenomenology is, is the task of providing insight into what is the essential parts of experience 
and in this particular case, the, the experience of pain. Okay, so oftentimes you'll hear about phenomenology as if it's just this big collection of every way a person describes the experience, right? Almost like a stream of consciousness type of, type of experience. And that is not this approach. That is not this author, Gene Eustace's approach. What he says, the, the, the true uh, classic phenomenology is what is the essential components of of different peoples, of everybody's experience of pain, what, it, what are the aspects of that that are essential, right? Otherwise, if you leave it in this kind of stream of consciousness, almost just a qualitative description of pain, it kind of falls within the, uh, the criticism of solipsism, right? Whatever, whatever my truth is, is the truth, and nobody else can tell me otherwise because they don't have access to my truth, okay? And that's a problem, okay? So, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this is a, a potential way, the phenomenological approach is being thought of as a way to potentially access a first person narrative from the people that are experiencing pain. And we all have experienced pain, so we have a, familiar, a familiarity with this. Right. So when he goes through his phenomenology of chronic pain, he says that it has to have three essential qualifications. It must be temporally extended, it has to be chronic, uh, it must be localizable within the body. In other words, it's not the pain of heartache. Uh, and it must be experienced indubitably. Indubitably means without doubt. You know, if you have pain, there's no doubt that you have pain. It's something that you are certain of. Okay? Now, this is where I think it gets interesting. They say that, that it is the depersonalizing and repersonalizing process that make up the temporal structures of the chronic pain experience. So when you get, when you have chronic pain, it breaks down your personhood. It changes what it is for you to be a person living in this world. And it rebuilds your personhood in a different way. Okay, and that is the sequence of events that happens. Um, and they go through some specifics of what that, what that change looks like. It's a rupture that unsettles four of the most fundamental relations. The relation between the self and the body, the relation between the, the self and the self, and the self and others, and the surrounding world. And we're going to go through these individually. Okay, so the idea of this rupture of the body is that the body is no longer subservient to the self. When you look at your body as your vessel for uh, going out into the world to make things happen for you. Um, the thought here is that the, in, in chronic pain, the body is no longer subservient to your, to your will. It's like a loss of agency. Okay? Self-relation... Self this robs a person of self-confidence and self-resilience One feels crippled. They don't have the confidence that their body is there for them to do the things that they want to do. Um, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a loss of a, of a sense of resilience. Okay. Okay, it's a rupture of, your, of relations with others. Pain can be very isolating. It creates a breach. This kind of goes hand in hand with your body is a subservient vessel. It, it creates a border instead of an access point for you to interact with others, right? And this was an interesting quote that I wanted to make sure to put in here. If there's a single experience shared by virtually all chronic pain patients, it's that at some point those around them come to question the authenticity of the patient's experience of pain. And that's very isolating, right? Chronic pain renders us dependent on others. And then the last is the surrounding world. The body becomes a wall at interacting with the environment instead of, its, instead of the vessel for interaction. Okay, So why I think that this is potentially important and why it's made a difference for me clinically is that I think if you look in terms of the third person perspective that we get from the biopsychosocial framework, right, that gives us some useful information. But when we shine the patient through that lens, it gives us only that third person perspective, right? But when we look at that information through the lens of what that person's uh, phenomenal, phenomenological experience of pain is, it makes more sense of the third person information. And, and this is something Todd and I were actually talking about last night. I feel like this kind of makes sense for what we already do, right? I mean, we don't really do that thing where we just collect a bunch of information and the person's sitting over there and we say that, 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 and that. We go and we talk to them and we find out how is this problem keeping you from doing the things that you want to do, right? How is this keeping you from, from doing the things that are important, seeing the people that are important to you? And we kind of put those things together. Making it explicit, though, I think helps 
us to organize the ways that we are going to interact with people. Right? It, helps us, uh, it helps us go after this information in, in more focused ways. At least I, I feel like that's, that's what it's done for me. Okay. So we can look at how does a target of an intervention impact the settling of those ruptured domains, those ruptured relations as well. Okay. So instead of looking at what is just within these realms, we want to look at where we can look at the, the narrative that they're bringing to us and how does this fit within the various ways that they're um, their relationship with themselves and with the environment and with their body has been ruptured. Okay? So this gives us more diverse information. We, we now have access not to just the third person and the shared narrative where we are sitting with them in our treatment space and creating a, a collaborative narrative but also potential access to their first person stories. Okay? Uh, because there is a, a big line of thinking that the only way a person can communicate their pain is through stories and metaphor. Right, if Mike were here, he'd be talking to us about that, I'm sure. Okay. And some interesting things that have come out of this for me since this. This was Brawny's paper that came out last year, um, Living Well with Chronic Pain, a Classic Grounded Theory. So this was a qualitative paper uh, that Brawny put out last year. What, what they wanted to do was look at people who were living well with pain. Right? What was the commonalities with people who were successfully dealing with pain? These weren't people who had gotten better and, and didn't have pain anymore. These were people who had pain, continue to have pain, but considered their, um, their march in life to be successful. Okay? And what was really interesting was this concept of the process of reoccupying the self. Right, this kind of made sense to me with the, with the phenomenological approach as far as it's a depersonalization and a repersonalization. Right, so these types of things I, I think are interesting. They're, they're potentially um, theory generative. Right? These, gives us some, these give us some new ways that we might, uh, we might look for and, and, and study pain right, to see if if these things are important and if we attempt to rebuild these relationships, do we see the health impact uh, that we hope to see that comes out the other end, right? And importantly, what if it's wrong, okay? All right. So, thank you. I'm finished up a couple of minutes early here. Uh, I don't know if there's many questions. If there's not, then there's another fun game we can play. That's your chance to get your questions in. Yeah. Anybody? I don't see any. What do you got? All right. Oh. Okay. We'll be patient. Uh, there is a thank you from, um, oh, from both Diane and Robert Rex. Thank you. Great unpacking, says Diane. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Diane, Thanks, for Diane. playing. Uh, here's Sandy. Um, what's the difference between a model and a framework? So a model is, so the question, what is the difference? Oh, yeah, it's right up there. I don't have to repeat it. So a model is meant to be a, a, a a carrying out of a, of a theory, right? How does this operate in the real world? If this theory is true, what should that look like or how should we be able to use it uh, is my, my understanding of that, right? So it would be, um, so the, the theory, for example, the biopsychosocial model is, is based upon or, or what Engel said was based upon was general systems theory, which is basically the idea that the, uh, the whole is greater, or the sum, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Right? If you make a change in one aspect of it, the, the change in the other two is going to be bigger than if this, the, the change happened on their own. Right? So a model of the biopsychosocial uh, might be something where if you, uh, if you changed this social factor, you would tend to see this particular change in, this, in the psychological and the biological aspects of it that go along with it. Right? It's, a bit, it's meant to be a bit more predictive. So versus a framework, can be a bit more, a, a bit more loose. It doesn't. Uh, it's it's not quite.
quite as constrained. Uh, theories might be generated from frameworks. Uh, predictable uh, or, or falsifiable tests might grow out of that framework. Um, but it's meant to be something that kind of guides in, in, the, in, the, in the case of a clinical framework. It might be something that gives you ideas to organize your treatment. Okay, and then we had a, we had a flood of questions. They oh really boy. didn't want to play your they game. They didn't want to play my game. <laughs> mm -mm. No more numbers questions. Yeah. Okay, so from Alice, for those, of you, for those of us who have not heard about the Mosley BIM study, can you tell us a, more about that? Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, go from the top of my head here, which I'm pretty bad at usually, but I'll do my best. Uh, so what they did was they looked at it, they, they recruited large numbers of patients, uh, one group went through explain pain, right? They went through the explain, the exp explain, plain, <laughs> explain pain curriculum, right? And, uh, and they went through it in a, in a rigorous manner. Uh, I mean, the, the, the therapist who went through, or the therapist who administered the treatment were trained by Lorimer Mosley. And I mean, he's the guy who came up with it and teaches this, right? So it's not like you can say they weren't doing real explain pain. Okay, so they went through a full regimen of explained pain. The other group went through a placebo education, I believe, uh, and they let it run. They looked at the results, and they were equivocal, right, for their primary outcome measures. They did find some things in their secondary outcome measures, but they couldn't make uh, conclusions. That basically is a step towards maybe now we need to look at another study with now those things as the primary outcome measures, right? And the secondary outcome measures, I think, were related to cost cost of care, there was some indication that the, the people who'd been through the explained pain uh, treatment had less, uh, had less health care expenditure. So that's and something else I think they'll yeah, look Yeah, and I think at. also decreased disability. So maybe their pain didn't go down. I reviewed that article for Physio Network. Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, thanks for standing up here with me. You're welcome. I'm here for you. Okay. Yeah, and it really was, is it okay if I say one more thing? Please, yeah. So the, and the placebo, right? So like what's placebo education? And it was actually really neat. They were basically just listening and like and if it's turned into an awkward stare be like what are you doing this weekend like so it was like right. really just um it, it really or actually it wasn't even like i wouldn't even consider it placebo education but more along the lines of if i'm remembering correctly of just professional interaction yes i believe that's right cute little back pain yep so, so it's, it's actually that's the agent traeger one Yep. Yeah. Yep. Adrian Traeger. So Adrian was the, Traeger. The and there is also a podcast. There's on a that. podcast on that. Shameless self plug. <laughs> but it, it is a really neat study, and that is a great point about um, Professor Mosley is that he's like, is this right? Even though it's his own work. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know the the how might this be wrong? I mean that is uh, you see so many uh, so many research projects out there where the, the the proponent of the method is solely focused on proving that it works. Right? So it's pretty cool that the proponent of this method set out to show that it didn't work because if the idea and what Popper always said, I brought up Karl Popper, is that a strong theory will withstand a serious attempt to refute it. Right? So the more serious the attempt at the refutation, if a theory can withstand that, the stronger the theory is standing on the other side. Right, so, so there's value to this. I mean, kudos to, to Dr. Mosley for saying, you know, I'm, really, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look for whatever it will take to show that this might not work because if it comes out on the other side, then it's, then it's a stronger theory. Okay. Yep, awesome. Okay, so now we have a question from Jennifer Carr, and there's actually some conversation around it, but we'll let you have a go at her question. Okay. In terms of commonalities of those who live well with pain, can we teach these commonalities to people who are not living well with pain. Uh, Can you elaborate on these commonalities? Yeah, that's the question, isn't it? Um, so at this point, I don't know if you can bring that slide back up so you can look through Bronnie's, Bronnie's chart here. There it is. So this is what they saw as the commonalities, and she's got them listed out here, and the article is really good. Uh, they, they split it out into some really um, specific categories, really well organized. Um, so what they saw is that as a person was trying to achieve what was called self-coherence, so this is this kind of coming together, this, I think it's consistent with this idea of repersonhood, as they're trying to make sense of their issue, um, they, would, 
they would come to a, a they called it naming, basically assigning a, a name to their problem, getting something that they could call their problem, right? And, it, and they gained some predictability. They no longer felt like it was so um, unpredictable, the things that were gonna happen to them. They still would have flares, uh, they still would have problems, but they had uh, some idea of how that was gonna play out. So it got a little bit more predictable. Um, the existing portion, uh, so I'm drawing a blank on that. Uh, flexibly persisting was the other big aspect of this. So making sense and flexibly persisting were the two big themes that they saw. And that consisted of occupational engaging. And occupational was not just work. This was just uh, continuing to participate in activity, the things that they do, OK? Um, successful coping strategies. And they had uh, a, a big kind of interesting series of categories that went along with that, all the different ways that they coped. Um, and then future planning, again, this kind of goes along with the predictability of it, uh, having the ability to, to plan for the future, to not feel like you can't ever uh, make plans or do anything because you don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, so the, the question about uh, is there, uh, could you bring that question back up again so I could see how it was, how it was worded? About whether going at these different categories uh, and if that can be taught, I, I think that that is the question that nice qualitative studies like this bring out, right? That's the question. So we know that people, or it looks like people that, that are successful with chronic pain have these things in common, and it would make sense that if we could try to get people that weren't behaving in that way to behave that way, that maybe there would be some, some impact of that, but it doesn't always shake out how you think. That's something that you would have to test. So that's why I feel like this is kind of a, a, a nice first step. Uh, Bronnie, would, I'm sure, would be, uh, would be chomping at the bit to add if she were here. But um, that's, that's kind of where I feel like it's at. It's, it's potentially that that is where it's going to be. But, but at this point, all we can say is that it looks like that this is what they have in common. All right, next question is from Mark Cargola. Um, what would your recommendations on how we can translate this view of BPS to our new clinicians or students about to enter their respective profession? Yeah, I, I think the cool thing about this is that because it is experiential and it's about what is common about experience, it, may, it, it makes sense, it feels familiar because it is, we have all experienced pain of some sort or another. Uh, so I actually think it, it kind of helps, it kind of makes it a bit easier to translate some of the biopsychosocial aspects that we like to teach because then you could put them in the context of, okay, yes, you know, people don't feel pain like a series of like, okay, you know what pain feels like? It feels like, you know, about 70% depression and, you know, like I'm on the lower 30% of the socioeconomic status and I'm kind of catastrophizing. You know, that's not what pain feels like, but, but people, you know, this idea of like, you know, when I hurt, I can't do the things that I want to do. And it feels like, you know, my body is not my own body anymore. It's kind of fighting against me. Um, and I can't, uh, I can't go see my family and I can't play with my grandkids. And I don't have the confidence that when I try to do something, I'm not going to be in bed all day tomorrow. Like that just makes that people uh, get that kind of from a, from a gut feeling, I think. So, so using that information and saying, okay, this person, part of their part of their presentation is their knee hurts and they're worried that it's never going to feel right again and it's no longer the same knee that they had and now they can't go out into the community and play bridge once a week like they love to do because that's where they go and they meet their friends, right? That can kind of give focus to some of the biopsychosocial aspects, right? So now we know we've got a better idea of how that knee pain impacts their social, their social ability, their ability to get out and socialize. And we know that how much the, the fact that they can't get out and socialize that way makes that knee pain all the more important for them, right? So I, I feel like it clarifies things in both directions. Very good. I think we have time for at least one more. Okay. So this one's from Richard McLemoyle. Putting this into application, do you try to set targets for re-inhabiting the self? Is there any research on self-identification of the idea being helpful? Yeah. So. Basically, what I just described is kind of how I put this into application. I'm not aware of any uh, particular research on self-identification, um, but uh, it, it's, what I was thinking would be a, a neat next 
direction to look into this would be there should also be a phenomenology of recovery, right? So this is the phenomenology of what it is to be in chronic pain. Uh, it would make sense that there is also kind of like what Brawny is getting at with her study, what is the, the, the commonalities, the essential aspects of the experience of recovery, right? And with that, we might be able to, again, generate some, some scientific hypotheses that can be tested. But I, at this point, I'm not aware of anything that's, that's on that. Awesome, all right, let's do one more. Okay. The last one will be from Jared Hall. Do you feel that the BPS framework can coexist with the concept of inactivism, the five E's of Stillwell and, and Harmon? Yeah, uh, I don't know that I'm the person to really speak to that in, in too much detail. I know in that paper they, they go through um, the changes that they think need to be made, uh, and they, they advocate for a, a big turn towards a first-person perspective. Um, you know, I would say I, I feel like I, I feel like we need to get that first-person perspective. Um, there's been talk about getting uh, the patient's voice into guidelines. Um, we, we're going to have a patient panel tomorrow. There's been I, I know talking to, to Joe and Keith that they were at the IASP and they were at CSM. So like, there's there's good things happening there. Um, but in terms of that particular model, um, how it coexists with an activism. I'm just not familiar enough with an activism probably to speak to that very well, but uh, I would encourage anybody who is interested in that to look at that paper, um, the, inactive, um, the inactive approach to uh, the biopsychosocial model. See, again, I can't think of these things off the top of my head. That sounded pretty yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, the Stillwell, Stillwell paper, yeah. Okay, awesome, we're good. All right, thank you. All right, and thank you, Corey. Um, all right, so we have another break. Uh, we're gonna start up with the second to last speaker at 4.15. So have a quick break and then please come back.